the last three weeks or so, I've been talking about uh, looking at the Christian relationship with, and I, I, uh, I want to say Old Testament law, and the reason is because really everything we're supposed to be doing these days as Christians is also found in the Old Testament law. And so a new, you know, so you, we could say just the law, you know, the commands, but really it's, it's, it's codified in the Old Testament. Uh, now, New Christian, he understands the law, uh, that there is a law. The law, there is a law that has something to do with him. He, he, he's got that somehow if, because he's baptized for the remission of his sins, right? So he comes up out of the water, ah, his sins are all remitted. Well, as soon as you say sins, and obviously you broke something, you know, some, he's got to be conscious somewhat, somewhere that he has sins that need to be remitted. All right, that makes sense. And so then in that case, there must be some law or command someplace that he's violated. It tells him, in, you know, no matter how ignorant he is, he still has that feeling in his conscience that God's mad at him for something. Okay, and so it's instinctive, really. It's, it's so basic. It's, 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 it's almost instinctive. <clears throat> so sin equals a law that's been broken somewhere, somehow, someplace. All right. So then, see, the fact that we're saved right from the moment we emerge from the water, see, in no way does that mean that we don't have a law to measure our thoughts and motives and actions by. We know that. We do. Okay. But our relationship with the law has been changed. It's, it's different now than it used to be a long time ago, back in the Old Testament times. See, before Christ, it was a case of, uh, uh, if you do the law, then you can get saved. That was the way it was back then. That's what it said. But now it's a matter of, now that you are saved, I want you to do the law. That's what Jesus said. <laughs> See, he said, teaching them to, to observe all things. That was what Jesus commanded. Uh, what, uh, teaching them, after they're saved, you baptize them, and then teach them to observe all things where, whatsoever I have commanded you. It's at Matthew 28, 19, 20. You know the Great Commission. And so after they're saved, you teach them how I want them to live. That's what you guys do. That's your job. Okay. See, but there's an unlawful use of the law, too. We need to take a quick peek at that. That's, uh, we're cautioned against that in 1 Timothy 1.8, where Paul says, uh, he, he wrote, We know the law is good, and then he has this little qualifier, if a man uses it lawfully. See, that is, the, the law is for the Christians to use, but we've got to use it in the right way. All right, we need to be aware that there's an unlawful use of the law, right? Okay, that is, and, and that unlawful use is if we try to use the law to establish our own righteousness. That's what you can't do. See, it didn't work anyway. And so the lawful use of the law is to, is to identify sin, to discover where we're wrong, to correct ourselves. You know, the guy come up out of the water and then you start learning what we're supposed to be doing, right? Okay, it's like breathing. We seek forgiveness for some sin or other. Whenever we do that, we are observing the law. Say, so oh, I broke the law. You know, I sinned. I broke a command. I did something wrong that God doesn't like. And so um, it's, it's like breathing, see, like we were talking about last week. You know, we, we are alive to God, and so we naturally breathe, spiritually speaking. We naturally observe the law, spiritually speaking. And if we're not aware of breathing, it doesn't matter because you breathe anyhow. You know, that just goes on. That's what, that's what happens. So last week, we compared the law to, to like a reading primer. You know, look, look, oh, look. You know, that was in some sense it is. Uh, uh, you know, Roger and I learned to read up there at PCA. And I remember those books just fine, you know. Uh, I know who Dick and Jane are. You know, I just, you know, long familiarity. And so, uh, so uh, like a first grade entry level law would be the one where in Le Leviticus 19 and 14, don't curse the deaf, don't trip the blind people. You know, you, uh, you know, that, well, a Christian, you know, that, that's an entry level law. That's what you just, you know, those kids, right? You know, a Christian at the first grade level, he might very well need to be told not to trip a blind man. Uh, does William know not to trip blind people? <laughs> I was just wondering, look, you know, my brother Norman, now that he's not here, I'm going to tell on him, I'm going to rat him out. <laughs> my mom, one day, Norman, he's like, 
you know, this big, something like that. <clears throat> and so he's sitting by the door that goes in from the kitchen into the living room. He's sitting there doing whatever he's doing. Mom, it's probably Sunday because it sound, that's the only time I ever saw her really bustle trying to get us ready to go to church. And so she, you know, on iron and closes and whatever she does, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And so Norman, he's checking this out. Whoa, and there she goes. Whoa, and I, All right, fine. And so on the way into the living room, dude, sticks out his foot. He tripped my mom and <laughs> you know, he's flat on the face. And she gets up and looks at him. No, he couldn't have done that on purpose. So she goes on about her business, right? But he did. <laughs> he told me so. <laughs> now, my point is you never know about new Christians. You know, maybe you do need to tell them not to trip their mothers. You know, I don't know. All right. But anyway, you see, so for these guys, these really new Christians, there is a law that says don't trip the blind man. You know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's like, don't trip your mom either. See, these are ABCs of spirituality, you know, it's, you know, but there's another point I want to make here. See, <clears throat> a long time ago, I heard someone say that had been a Christian or maybe still is sort of, kind of, but you Christian just go by a book of rules. That's what I was told and see, but it was the way that she said rules with her lips, they were stuck out and her breath, disdain, you know, rules, you guys just go by rules, just like, you know, like that. And, and so I'm kind of slow thinker, you know, I don't, I don't always have a ready made answer. And I, I, I didn't respond really. I didn't know what to say. I, not immediately. Uh, you know, I, I thought about a lot about what she said though. And it kind of bothered me. You know, I knew the problem that she was having immediately. What was happening was she wanted to do something that God was telling her not to. That, that was what was bugging her. But it was the accusation about the law that, that had me going, oh, the rules, you know, like that. And so, uh, I, you know, so she faulted the law. Okay, fine. That was plain. See, but then the question comes up in my mind, well, exactly what is it that's wrong with the law? What's bad about the law? You, you know, which is, she was, you know, it was an accusation. I mean, look, here's Deuteronomy uh, 29, or 20, 19 and 20, right? <clears throat> and so, uh, and so here's God. He's talking about these, the, I'm going to let you read it, you know, because we're, <laughs> we're running late, you know. And so anyway, but what's happening is God's instructing the armies of Israel. You guys go out, you're going to besiege this city and you're going to need a, a, a piece of wood for a battering ram or whatever else you're going to need, uh, need it for. It says, while you're at it, don't cut down the peach trees or the plum trees. Or it's okay to cut down the quince trees. I don't like those. But anyway, you know, the, the, the trees that bear fruit. It says, don't use those. Go get yourself a fir tree someplace. You know, that's the law, right? And so... Uh, uh, you know, how can anybody have a problem with a law like that? You know, what's the matter with that? It makes sense. He says, you guys are going to need something to eat after you conquer the land. Leave the trees alone. They take a long time. The fruit trees, they take a long time to grow. They're not going to produce right away. So don't go cutting them down. Do, you know, take it easy on the land. Oh, ooh, is that a problem? You know, I, what kind of, you know, why would anybody have a problem with a law like that? When you go to war. Make sure there's still something left on the land to eat. You know, uh, it, it, you know it's and not only that, God made it a law. See, so that means the generals are supposed to, you know, the guys who are in command, they're supposed to observe it. You know, and so uh, you know, you generals, go get a fir tree, leave the peach trees alone. See, it's a good rule. It's a good law. It makes sense. You know, or what about this other one? Here's, uh, here's another one in Deuteronomy 23, 12, 13, and 14. Just check this out. Here you guys are. This is God again. You know, the armies are out marching away. And they're going to camp overnight. Going to set up their bivouac. And Tony knows about this. I know about this. I camped. I was in the guard. We had to do that every two weeks. Well, I'll tell you one thing. See. You know, and so God says, what you do is when you set up your tents and all that, you go find yourself a spot out from the camp someplace. And every one of you guys is supposed to be carrying a little shovel with them. And we all know what that shovel's for because they've got to take a dump. 
And so you guys go out there in this land and you get, dig a little hole and you do your business and you cover it back up. Thing. And so you dig a latrine. That's the law. You know, you make a latrine. You know, when my brother Bill, he bought this land <clears throat> up there outside. You know, a lot of us have been up there. And uh, we're all camping. The first thing you do, see, we have a big family. And the first thing you do when you have a big family is you figure out where you're going to put your potty. You know, that's the first thing. Quick hole. <laughs> stick a bucket without a, without a bottom on it. Maybe you can find some kind of a lid or something to set over it so you don't fall off. So it's not too uncomfortable. Put yourself a tarp around it and you're in business. It's the first thing we did. You know, and, and, uh, and then later on, got the back hose up there and dug us a serious latrine. But that's, you have to do that. I've been places where they didn't do that. And it's awful. Okay. And so, you know... And so that's the law. When you're out camping as an army, dig a latrine. You know, why in the world would anybody stick out their lips and say, oh, there's God again with another one of his rules? <laughs> you know what happens if you don't do it? You get to be like L.A., <clears throat> certain parts of it. It's been in the news lately where all the homeless right they're wandering up and down the streets at night and they just have taken to doing their business wherever they want and so you know so here's this guy he's out you know it's night nobody can see him so he drops his drawers and deposits one on the sidewalk and all the time he's thinking oh that's not my problem yeah i'm leaving and so he pulls up his drawers and you know what happens to him he goes down about another 20 feet and he sticks his foot into somebody else's deposit. Now it's your problem, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And so, you know, you can you know, by the way, this is a gripe. You can't tell me just because a guy's homeless, he can't take a shovel with him, you know, and do something about that. You know, these guys, every one of them to a man has an iPhone. They can certainly have a shovel. So, you know, no sympathy. Anyway, so God says, when I, I, I'm going to come around the camp at night, I'm going to inspect your camp, and I don't want to see little dudes laying all over. That's what he says. <laughs> I don't want that. You know, we, and we know why. Human feces are dangerous. Flies get on them. You know, they get on us. <laughs> they get in our food. Or we track them into our tents, or we get, we get diseases off of them. And so here's, you know, this Old Testament is about 630 laws and regulations and stuff i've been given to understand never tried to count them but it covers a fair amount of things it covers uh the old testament law uh, covers sanitation that would just like this one or uh, uh quarantine or public nuisance laws pits you know if you dig a pit put a put a, a barrier around it if you have a swimming pool put up a fence if you have a balcony up on your roof you put a you know you put a what a balisade a a, a, bal a a barrier around it, you know, so people don't fall off. There's uh, laws about uh, dangerous animals or honesty in business or correct weights and measures. You know, you got to have a, a fair weight and measure. How to administer courts. There's criminal justice. There's respect for leadership. There's marital relationships and family relationships. How kids are supposed to relate to their moms and dads. Uh, uh, laws re re relating to immigrants. Uh, judges, you know, they're not supposed to take bribes. Um, uh, uh, you know, on and on and on. See, and, and nearly every one of the, I think every one of these categories have their counterparts in our laws in the United States today. Uh, I, I think that we have, except much larger laws, you know, about millions of them, I think. But anyway, this is all all out of out of this. See, so what I'm getting at is that the law as written by God in the Old Testament, seems so fair, so reasonable. And you know, it, 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 you know it, it's not heavy. We, we do this stuff anyway. You know, what's the problem? So it, it's kind of a slander against God's law. So why does somebody come along and goes, you Christians and your rules? My God, that's nuts. You know, you do them too because you have to, because you, you know, you use the potty chair, right? Okay, so anyway, so answer me this. And so now we're going to switch over a little bit to something that Peter said. Answer me this then. If, 
if the law is not heavy at all, if, uh, if that's the case, see, then why in the world did Peter say what he said in Acts 15 and, and, uh, and 10? Where he goes, the whole thing is up there. The, the, the context is up on the screen. But the part I'm interested in is verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? We hated digging latrines. Ah! I don't think that was it. I don't think that was his problem, was it? Not really. See, so what happened was that the early church, what this was, was the situation was that the early church, the leadership of the early, early church was mainly Jewish. Okay. And so uh, they were uh, debating whether or not the Gentile Christians had to keep the law in its entirety. Circumcision and all, that's what they were talking about. And some, some Christians who were also Pharisees, they, they were Christians, they were followers of Christ, but they were Pharisees. And they said, uh, the Christians, you guys, the Gentiles have to do this stuff. And, uh, but the decision of the church was they didn't anyway. But see, you keep in mind that at that time, the, the Jewish Christians still considered themselves Jews who were Christians. They were Jews and they were followers of, followers of Christ. See? And many of them still observed the temple rituals. Paul did. He went to the temple to uh, pay a vow and he had Timothy circumcised, you know. And so Paul is still doing that. I uh, see, but this phrase, what about that phrase with, that Peter said, which neither, about the law, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What was so hard? What was it? See, the thing about the law is that smack dab in the middle of all those rules and regulations, see, it, it was the means of forgiveness for all the violations of those rules and regulations. Like if you didn't, if you didn't bury your, your poos, right? If a person failed to keep all the rules and all the commands, that is if he cheated someone in the business or, or something like that, he would go to the temple and he'd offer a sacrifice and his sins would be forgiven. See, forgiveness of sins is actually central to the law. Right there, the, the whole temple thing was so that people could get forgiven of their sins, see? And, I mean, there's no way to miss. You offer the sacrifices, you get forgiven. Easy peasy. <laughs> oh, what's hard about that? What is hard about that? See, and there the priest, see, a guy, you don't even have to know all the details about what sacrifice to offer or how it's supposed to be offered or anything like that. Uh, you know, what animal he had to use, how it was supposed to be killed, what parts were supposed to be put on the fire and what parts weren't and where the blood was to be put and all that stuff. See, that was the job of the priest anyway. You don't have to know any of that. You just take your animal up to, to get forgiven. That, you know, go to the, the, the altar of burnt offering, appear, here's your animal. And so, uh, and so here's a priest, he's right there with you. And he says, okay, put your hands on the, on the head of the sheep. You know, okay, confess your sins. Yeah, I did this and this and this and this. Cut its throat this way. Here, then, now you move over and let me collect some blood. And so he gets blood. He's got a little thing there to collect the blood in. And, and he says, we're going to put it on the altar this way. We splash some on this side. And we put some on that side. And, <clears throat> and we dump the rest over here. And, you know, all of that. So the priests know that stuff. The guy didn't have to know that. Wasn't his problem, you know. He just had to. He just had to show up and, with his animal and get forgiven, right? Okay. See, and the thing is that God placed the means of salvation squarely in our own hands. We do it ourselves. It's a do-it-yourself thing. It's pretty cool. All we have to do, all the Jews had to do, just do the sacrifices and offerings. What's the problem? What's the problem with that? See, forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness was ours as often as we needed it. You can't miss with this system. The point I'm getting at is that the old law is a good system. Worked well. It didn't work fine. But it should have worked fine. See? And the fact that our salvation was squarely in our hands, see, that was the problem right there. See? That 
problem was apparent right from the beginning. Does anybody remember who Nadab and Abihu were? They were the sons of Aaron, just in case somebody doesn't remember. I'm sure everybody does. Offered strange fires. This is Leviticus 10 and 1. They, God says, hey, I want you to keep this fire and these censers just going perpetually. You don't let them ever go out. And through carelessness or whatever, and unfaithfulness, whatever it was, they let it go out. And, oh, what's the difference? We'll just fire up another fire. And so they did. And, and then God had the fire come out and consume them. <laughs> Fine. It's not all right. It was just fire. What difference did it make? But it did. It made a difference. It made a difference to the holiness of God. The point is, though, that Aaron and his sons had just been appointed to the priesthood. Just. Just now. And the first thing that happened was that the priests themselves, Nadab and Abihu, became corrupted. And you know why? Because they're men. That's why. That was the problem. You know, and that's been the problem from the get-go. You know, the history of the priesthood is exactly the same as the history of the kings of Israel. There is no difference. Failure after failure after failure. What about the sons of Eli? Anybody know what the sons of Eli were up to? What they liked to do was they were administering the, 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 the sacrifice and all that stuff, and, and they were priests. And so what they were into doing was when a guy come up to uh, uh, offer a sacrifice, they just raped his daughters. That's in 1 Samuel 2.22. Cool. So here comes this guy. He's got a need for forgiveness of sins, right? And you know who he has to administer that forgiveness? He's got the corrupted sons of Eli doing a sacrifice for him. See, this goes on and on and on. You think the kings were bad. The priests were every bit as bad as the kings were. And, you know, until Jesus finds this utterly corrupt house of Annas and, and Caiaphas ensconced in the temple with all their money changers. So, it's always been that way. And that is the problem with the law. Even if God puts the means of salvation right in our hands, we can't do it because we won't do it. We can't take care of our own mess. We always corrupt whatever it is that we touch, and that's the way sinful men are. The weakness of the law and the reason it didn't work was always us. Read it and weep. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. There you are. <clears throat> so the law, see, was our last, last best chance to redeem ourselves. It was up to us. You know, Leviticus 18 and 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Which, of course, they didn't. And Jesus said the same thing to a lawyer. You know, if you do the law, you live. Everything will be fine. Just do the law. That's Luke 10, 28. Give it your best shot. You know, with Annas and Caiaphas running the priesthood, go for it. See? The law, among other things, is God's object lesson. That's what we have here. It points to our own helplessness to save ourselves. We can't do this. That is, the law, see, as easy as it was. It was easy. That's not a problem. You know how many times you had to go to church under the old law? The ladies didn't have to go at all. <laughs> the guys had to go three times a year. <laughs> what do we, just imagine, you know, all the rest of those three times a year, you can go hunting. <laughs> Don't do anything. You want to go camping. But three times a year, you got to go to church. got to appear before the temple. See? See, the law, as easy as it was, though, according to Peter, was still too heavy, for we are as weak as newborns. And God is interested in demonstrating for us, you guys, you need a Savior. You're not going to do this on your own. So God's solution, then, was to take the means of salvation, the means of forgiveness, uh, out of our own hands and do the job himself. And so here comes this famous saying, if you want something done right, <laughs> you got to do it yourself. <laughs> God knows that one. He knows that one. And so back to Romans 8, 3. 
for what the law couldn't do. It was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So God sent Jesus to do the job that we can't. God sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sent us a high priest that's not corruptible. He's incorrupt. Jesus is incorruptible. He's not like Caiaphas and those guys. You know, he's, he's uh, you know, just the man we need. He's sinless. He's, he's someone untouched by greed or he never gets careless or he's never unsympathetic. This is our man. This is the guy. This is, this is all the, the one and the one that doesn't die in the office either. So his rotten sons can take over. This is the guy. You know, Jesus. Jesus is our man. There's a, how good does it need to get? See, with Jesus, you can't miss. You can't miss. He satisfies the holiness of God perfectly. Does offers the sacrifice, the best sacrifice of all, his own blood and his own body. And, he, you know, and he, he, God is totally satisfied. His holiness is totally justified. And then he satisfies our need for forgiveness perfectly, too. Oh, it's perfect. You know, and so, you know, no wonder in Matthew eleven thirty, you know what Jesus says? He says here, for my yoke is easy and my burden's light. You know why? It's because he's carrying everything himself. He's doing it all. Of course it's light. There's nothing left other than to believe on him. The law is still here for Christians. We're supposed to do it. See, and that's why we have a high priest. See, you have a high, you, the high priest, the, the fact that Jesus is a high priest is the high priest implies a law that he's high priest too so there's a law out there and we have a relationship with that it's just that we can't mess up forgiveness anymore see and that's why john he talks about sin being transgression of the law there's still sin still transgression still you know still law breaking first john three and four so you know, whoever trans, uh, commits sin transgresses the law. And then his definition of sin is sin is the transgression of the law. That's right. See, the law is still here. See, and of course, you immediately, somebody's going to bring up all about those ordinances. What about, what about the kind of clothes you could wear? And what about, you know, kind of meat you could eat and that kind of stuff? You know, what about all that? The, you know, the shoes you can wear, you know, and Paul mentioned, he talks about that in Hebrews 9, 8, and 10, uh, 9 verses 8 through 10. And so I won't read the whole thing, but get down to the bottom, which is where he comes to his conclusion. He said, uh, which stood only in meats and drinks and different washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until, see, that's temporary, until the time of Reformation. See, the stuff's temporary. He said, that stuff is all temporary. So what's left? Well, in addition to digging latrines, there's more. Hey, you know, there's the weightier matters of the law. Jesus talked about that in, in Matthew 23, uh, 23 and 23, where he's pronouncing woe on the scribes and Pharisees. He says, here you guys are, you're doing all the, all the, the, the tithing and the little you know, minutiae of the law. He says, you're omitting the big parts, you know, the weightier matters. And he said, you know what those are? Judgment, mercy, faith, see, you should have been doing all that stuff and, and done the other stuff too. But you should have been doing it. You were you ignoring that. Judgment, mercy, and faith. See, these things are still with us. And we still are supposed to observe them. You know, we, we work at it and, and we know that we fail. But nevertheless, we're supposed to do these things and dig the, the latrines too. We're supposed to do that, you know. Uh, we're not supposed to chirp our moms. You know, but our relationship to the law has changed, though. We observe these things not to obtain salvation. That, those days are over. That didn't work anyway. But what we observe, we observe these things. You know why? Because we're saved. Because Jesus said to do them. <laughs> you know, do them. You know, and so what's heavy about the law? <laughs> what's heavy about the law was us. You know, we're the ones who made it heavy. Yeah. But, but so, you know. That was the problem. That was what Peter was talking about. We're the problem. So, but now we have Jesus who makes the law light. Okay. So now it's time for the invitation. All right. So to the God who in no way, he's not going to trust us to accomplish our own salvation. He knows we're not going to anyway. He's not going to do that. He does that job himself. <laughs> what a Good God. 
Jesus is. He's good. Okay. <clears throat>